Hi. Hey, everybody. And thank you for uh, defying the sun to come in here and get warm with us. Uh, I am Anna Stjernholm. I'm the chairman of Atheist Society here in Denmark. Uh, we're the ones who is paying for this, so you're welcome. <laughs> and um, also, we had some help from our friends at Effective Altruism Denmark. And um, if you're one of those people right now thinking, what is Effective Altruism? I can't help you. <laughs> But uh, Joachim can. Uh, Joachim, where are you sitting? Ask this guy, Joachim uh, from Effective Altruism, he'll tell you how uh, he and his ideas also can save the world. And, <laughs> and if you are a bacon lover with a V8 engine in your car, you can just take their little flyer out there and read it and toss it aside in the woods somewhere. <laughs> if you'd rather <laughs> stay on that side of the board, you're welcome to do that. Uh, Michael Shermer is here to talk to us about uh, all the, the ideas he has in his head, and uh, you may you probably know him uh, even better than I do. He has, has founded and is still edu editor in chief of Skeptic Magazine. Wrote, I guess, 10 bestsellers by now, and have seen faith from all angles, uh, including first person. So we are proud and honored at Atheist Society Denmark to introduce to you Michael Shermer. Uh, would you like me to use the mic for the recording? Yes, okay, so, because I, I project pretty loud. Well, thanks for coming out. I can't believe it. We're driving over here. It's like, this is the best day of the year. Why would anybody? I don't even want to go to a lecture at <laughs> two in the afternoon. No, I really appreciate that. It's great. I've been in uh, Zurich for a talk and Luxembourg City for a talk and then back to Cologne tomorrow. I'm in Germany. My wife is from Cologne, Germany, so we're here visiting her friends and family. Uh, and so we threw in a few uh, fun talks just for, for fun. And then I just went to Christiana, and uh, where everything is free as long as you have money <laughs> to, buy, uh, to buy some um, contraband, I guess. It looks like there's enough there I could take back and open my own business in uh, California where it's legal now. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so... Um, Well, I, uh, I you know, normally just power through a PowerPoint, but we don't have that here, so it's actually more fun to just talk and then talk to you af after I uh, make a few remarks that we can talk about whatever you want, atheism or whatever, skepticism. There's a lot of current uh, issues, but I'll just kind of go back and give some general background about what I do. We publish Skeptic Magazine, um, which is a, uh, a quarterly publication of the Skeptic Society. We're a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization devoted to the investigation of claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups and cults and claims of all kinds. Between good science, junk science, bad science, voodoo science, pathological science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. Uh, operators are standing by if you want to subscribe uh, at skeptic.com. We actually have a print magazine. Uh, we're still Uh, one of the few hanging in there, uh, but more and more digital. So most of our content is available online at skeptic.com. And our mission mainly is uh, science, education, pro-science. We're in favor of science and reason and critical thinking, not just against uh, bad ideas, although you have to do both. Um, some people call us debunkers, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk that needs debunking, and that's part of what we all do. Uh, but we can't just define ourselves by what we don't believe. You know, we're atheists. Well, what does that mean? Well, we don't believe in God. Okay, now what? Well, now plenty. There's plenty to do. And uh, so, uh, that, you know, that's also part of our mission is to, you know, talk about um, what we can know about the world. And so, you know, that's my books have kind of marched through those subjects. Why people believe where things is about science and pseudoscience. And then how we believe is about science and religion. And then the science of good and evil is about science and morality. And Uh, now my next book that I'm uh, just editing, finishing up now, is called Heavens on Earth about the afterlife, or the lack thereof. <laughs> And uh, so there I kind of march through all the different uh, theological arguments for heaven, the afterlife, and, and, and immortality. And, uh, but, but the core of the book will be on scientific attempts to achieve immortality. Say what? <laughs> yeah, well, there, there are. There are, you know, radical life extensionists who think we can push the upper ceiling of 125 years beyond that. Um, 
And, you know, people say, well, we've doubled our lifespan, you know, in the last hundred years. No, no, we haven't really done that at all. It's just more and more people are pushing up against the upper ceiling, but no one's going, going past 125 or so. So, um, uh, so the attempts, that, that, so it just starts with radical life extension, minimal senescence, and then you work your way through, say, cryonics. You could be chronically frozen and come back thousand years from now and you could be a historian of the 21st century. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> Give lectures like this, you know. <laughs> Trump. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can talk about that too if you want <laughs> in the Q&A. Um, but this is science. So, um, and then, um, you know, so we were talking about morality and uh, so I, I guess one, one way to think about um, uh, the bigger picture of what, what we're doing with a- atheism, skepticism, humanism and so on is is taking you know the long thousands of years domination that religion has had over uh, pretty much everything art music morality uh, you know just pretty much everything humans have done and then slowly we've replaced it so my my book the moral arc kind of tracks this long uh, trajectory from about the enlightenment on in which science and reason began to replace uh, religion and dogma uh, Slowly, it's taken a long time, and uh, you know it's three steps forward, two back, three forward, two back. So I track, I think, pretty confidently that we've made a lot of progress, although still, admittedly, we have a long ways to go. So, but if you take things like um, the abolition of slavery, the abolition of torture, uh, the expansion of civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, now animal rights, animal rights. <laughs> Uh, and effective altruism. I mean, this is a good cause. These are the sorts of things uh, that we can see in real time happening and see then how it happens and who supports it and who resists it. So take the same-sex marriage debate, which you know just uh, played out in America in 2015 when the U.S. Supreme Court voted to uh, make it a federal um, protection that uh, it's not just a state uh, law, but that all states have to allow it. So that was a pretty big step, and you could see uh, how... It was pretty much resisted by the majority of people until 2011. Even Hillary and Obama were both against gay marriage when they campaigned. And Obama didn't change until 2011, and, and Hillary just shortly after that. So, and, and that's the liberal wing of, of the American uh, culture. And even they were pretty slow to resist. Of course, when somebody's campaigning, you never know what they say and why they say it in order to get votes because you have to win uh, before you can tell your real views. And even then, it's, it's hard to tell. So, um, yeah, and then the people that resisted it, uh, you know, were, were, of course, religious people. The most religious people were the slowest to come around. And the nuns, the so-called nuns, the people that checked the box for no religious affiliation, they were most supportive of it. And that group is the largest group in Western uh, countries the people with no religion. Now, I know that's not a big thing here in Northern Europe, <laughs> but in America, that's a pretty big thing. It's 25% of everybody and 33% of millennials, that is people born after 1981. Uh, so we're on the rise toward, um, well, not I wouldn't say dominant atheism, because uh, the nuns are just saying, I don't believe, I, I'm not affiliated with any religion. That doesn't mean they're atheists or agnostics or humanists, they, they may be followers of Deepak Chopra, and they think the universe is conscious and there's a great spirit and force in the sky, that, you know, some, something like that. But at least it's a start to get away from the old anthropomorphic gods or God, and, 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 and therefore put control back into our hands. So, um, and if you don't mind, it's a little warm <laughs> with the... Uh, Hottest day of the year. It's, why, it's like this, by the way, every day in Southern California. All year. No, <laughs> not quite. And uh, so, um, you know, so, so the moral arc, I, I track that progress. The big picture, of course, people think I'm hallucinating. You know, how can you say things are uh, better than they've ever been when you have things like, you know, and then they just rattle off North Korea, Iran, Syria, racism, whatever. Yes, of course, these things still exist. But if you take the bigger picture, you look at the trend lines rather than the headlines, um, then you can see that we've, we've made real progress. And I attribute most of that to secular forces of reason. Uh, basically, the Enlightenment, the idea that we can uh, solve social problems by thinking about them and how to solve them. Rather than accusing people of being sinners and talking about original sin, let's just treat it as a problem, homicide, war, uh, crime, whatever it is, and, and just figure out what's the 
technologies we can employ to solve these problems, to make them go down. And that's what we've been doing. And uh, even the concept of rights is kind of a tool. It's sort of a political technology to uh, expand the moral sphere and to cause all these things to move in the right direction. And that all began in the, with, with the rights revolutions uh, in the late 18th century and, and the idea of, from Enlightenment philosophers that, uh, that we can reason our way to these things, we can uh, engage things like rights and then just enforce them and, and then eventually you know, we get to where we are now. So it's a, it's a long, slow process. But, so I, I think that's you know, sort of the positive direction that we're, we've been moving and we'll continue to move, hopefully. <laughs> now, of course, there are a few things. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, things like Syria, you know, th those kinds of civil wars used to be much more common than they are now. Uh, North Korean dictatorship, you know, that's really the last of the super crazy dictatorships. Whereas, you know, half the country, well, maybe, <laughs> hopefully, uh, half the countries in the world used to be like that, you know, a century ago or half a century ago. So, you know, that's progress. And uh, hopefully we can even ride out things like uh, Donald Trump. I know everybody's worried about that, but... Uh, I don't think he's Orange Hitler. Uh, you know, I, I, just, I just don't think it's coming in that sense. And, uh, you know, this too shall pass. Uh, I think it's a good test of my thesis of the moral arc uh, and moral progress. You know, if, if we can get through this and still things are pretty good, then, you know, then it, it can't get any worse than that, could it? Um, so, okay, so um, let's just kind of go through some different topics here. I think... Uh, since this is the atheist group, what is atheism? Again, it's not, a, it's not really a thing like a worldview where really humanists outline the things that we believe in, civil rights, civil liberties, equal treatment under the law, things like that. Atheism is just lack of a belief in a God. So, uh, and then it's good to make that distinction between strong atheism and weak atheism. I think most scientists are weak atheists. That is, we just don't believe in God, full stop. You know, to say I'm a strong atheist, that is, I, I know there's no God, yeah, that, that would be difficult to prove, although you can have something like a sliding scale that, that Dawkins uses in The God Delusion where you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm a six out of seven. It, it's very, very, very unlikely. And, but, but even with that, you're just saying it's so unlikely, I'm just not going to believe. Okay, so you know, there's the ontological question, does God exist? You know, we can't ultimately know in some empirical sense, but no one acts and believes and you know, behaves in the world an ontological way, you, you, be, you believe in an epistemological way. That is, you make decisions, this is what I believe and I'm going to act on it. I don't believe this, I'm not going to act according to that. And so we behave in a way that we're atheists or we, we just don't believe. You know, so technically, I'm an agnostic, don't know. Uh, behaviorally, atheist all the way, for sure. Um, in terms of what I believe positively, science, reason, rights, and so on, that's, a, that's kind of a humanist worldview. I, I guess what I'm getting at is, it, it'd be nice if we had another name, <laughs> Uh, that was, you know, a little more positive. I don't know. Uh, back about 10 years ago, there was a movement afoot to kind of follow the gay rights movement. And, uh, you know, they, they the people uh, who drove that revolution, changed the tone by saying gay rights and gay pride and, you know, gay marches and, and, and so on. It was positive. So a, a couple back in the late 90s said, let's call ourselves brights. We're the brights. We're not atheists, we're the Brights. It's a happy, happy name. <laughs> and, of course, people that are not atheists are, are not bright, they're dim. So <laughs> that didn't go over really well uh, with the people that, you know, are in that camp. Uh, anyway, but that's, that was sort of an interesting, a bunch of us, Dennett, Dawkins, me, and, and others, tried to, you know, promote it. Yeah, yeah, let's color it. But it doesn't really work that way. You know, language doesn't work from the top down. It either just takes off, you know, like 9-11. Why did that? I don't know. No, I don't know. It just started getting used and that's it. So, you know, we're atheists. We're skeptics. We're humanists. I just sort of rattled the words off. Uh, we're, you know, pro-positive science or something like that. Um, now, uh, there's been some tension in the last decade or so about, in the atheist community, about what we should be doing uh, and I don't have the answer because I don't think there is one answer. You know, should we be out there, like Hitch, uh, you know, just you know, just hitch slapping anybody <laughs> that believes this idiotic nonsense about religion? It's like, okay, for some people that works. I mean, Richard says, you know, I have a lot of mail. You know, people that, uh, you know, that change their mind. And you know, of course, he said this on Bill O'Reilly's TV show on Fox News, to which O'Reilly says, I have even more letters than you have. So. 
you know, piling up letters probably doesn't count for that much. So, but I think you know, sometimes that approach works. Hitchens' approach works. There's lots of different angles you can come up with. So a recent column I wrote in Scientific American, um, which was on, called The Backfire Effect, and it, start, it starts off like this. Have you ever noticed that whenever you engage somebody in a conversation, that when you show them the facts that contradict their beliefs, they always change their mind? <laughs> yeah, and then the, my next line was, yeah, me neither. So, um, so part of the problem is called a backfire effect, sort of a popular term being used now by psychologists, but it's really just cognitive dissonance. And so, um, and this was discovered by um, a psychologist, um, Leon Festinger, when he was a young psychologist in 1954, when he caught wind that a woman in Chicago who was a devotee of Dianetics, which is what it was called before it became popularly known as Scientology. And Dianetics, uh, so she had this thing about, chan you know, you know you Scientology is a UFO cult, right? We came from this other planet, T no, we're Tigiak. It was, um, you know, the, this galactic warrior Xenu from this other, anyway. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Uh, but she got um, a, a, a vision through automatic writing, which is what psychics used to do back in the 19th century, that the world was going to come to an end on December 21st, 1954. Uh, the earth would rent open and there would be massive flooding in the Midwest of the United States uh, uh, at midnight on December 21st. And so the mothership was going to you know, come down from on high and whisk away the seekers, the small group of people, a few dozen, that were her followers. So... Uh, Fessinger got wind of this and th said this would be a great opportunity to go study to see what happens when prophecy fails. <laughs> Presuming the world wouldn't end, he's up there with his clipboard going, okay, let's see what happens. Uh, and uh, see if they change their mind. Like, you know, okay, so they're up there and he's like, okay, it's 11.55. It's, you know, it's ooh, it's gonna happen. It's midnight and, you know, 12.05, 12, 12, what time have you got? Man, maybe my, she's a little, oh, 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 it's, it's Pacific time, not central time, you know. We're off by an hour, wait till two, three. Okay, it's not even East Coast, okay. So, you know, and then it's, uh, and then they came back the next night and, and, and basically he tracked them for the next year and, and and not only did they not change their mind, and, you know, that was the dumbest thing I've ever, can I have my car back? <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of, they gave away their stuff. You know, they're, they're, they're leaving forever. And uh, so, you know, but, but not only did they not change their mind, they doubled down on their beliefs. They, they went out and tried to recruit more people, you know, with a litany of rationalizations. Well, we miscalculated the date, you know, forgot to carry the one or whatever. And, uh, or it was a test of our faith, uh, and we passed the test. So God, you know, or the aliens or whoever, you know, this, this is common for all these doomsday scenarios. Uh, or uh, or it, it, was, it was not a specific prophecy, it was a general prophecy, uh, which is what the JWs are talking about now. I just ran into a bunch of them down in the Cologne Dome and also in Luxembourg City. They were all out in force with the, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses, with the little booklets, with the four horsemen. It, it wasn't Hitch and, no. <laughs> no, it's the other, the real four horsemen, the real four horsemen. And, you know, so I, of course, I always engage these people because it's fun. And, and, uh, and I give them a copy of Skeptic when they give me a copy. You know, and, uh, you know, we exchange phone numbers. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, uh, you know, th now they used to make very specific predictions. You know, the day, they've learned to stop doing that. Nobody knows when the end is coming. God says, yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, can you, can you be like within a decade or, you know, it's, ch it's, ju it's coming. All right, so... Anyway, um, uh, and so uh, that, that's pretty typical, or, or a general date, or that um, it was a test of our faith, we passed the test, or it was, a, it was a physical manifestation in some other unpredictable way. You know, there was an earthquake in California. That's a shocker. You know, something that you can find, uh, or uh, it did change spiritually. We are all reborn spiritually. Don't you feel different now? That was it. Okay, so... Anyway, Fessinger called this uh, cognitive dissonance, and he wrote it up in a book, and it's called When Prophecy Fails. It's a great book. It's the start of a huge uh, field of study in cognitive science uh, of cognitive dissonance, and it's one of the most replicated um, theories in all of psychology. And it is that people double down on their beliefs. If their core beliefs, if their beliefs that they define themselves by, like these are the six things that I consider myself, these are non-negotiable things. These are the five things I believe, whatever. 
So if your facts go against those, uh, then that's when you, it, it, people spin doctor the facts. If it's some small thing that you don't have a dog in the fight, there's no you know, loss to your prestige or status, friends and family and so on, it's not a big thing. But for, 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 for something like you know, climate change, just, take, just go through some of these, climate change. You know, when you're dealing with a climate denier, uh, they don't really care about tree ring data, ice core data, parts per million of CO2 gases in the atmosphere and how rapidly they've changed over the last 50 years versus 10,000 years and so on. They want to know if it's real and those liberals are going to change laws and interfere with free market capitalism and industry and I define myself as a free market capitalist entrepreneur pro-business and those liberals are going to... That's what they're really after. So... If you go right in at their core beliefs, like creationists, you know, they don't really care. They don't know much about DNA, RNA, punctuated equilibrium, fossil record. If I have to accept this Darwin stuff, do I have to be an atheist? Because I don't want to be an atheist. I don't want to give up Jesus. And, you know, if I have to give that up, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to believe evolution. Or, um, see, some of the anti-vaxxers, you know, they think that you know, big pharma is in cahoots with the government and somebody's making a lot of money, therefore you know, they're sacrificing children <clears throat> at the altar of you know, autism because of the vaccine. You know. So again, it's just hitting these core uh, beliefs. So usually I try to do an end run around this. Um, so again, if you attack head on, for, okay, so first of all, don't, don't insult people. Don't tell that your idea is just bullshit. I could, boom, the wall goes up. Or, you know, you're an idiot. The wall goes up. Cognitive dissonance kicks in. They spin doctor the fact. They're not even listening anymore. You know, no um, ad hominem, as it's called. Or, as we like to say, no ad Hitlerum. Okay. No ad, you know, reductio ad Hitlerum. The, mom the moment you tell somebody that they're Nazis or their beliefs are like Hitler, it's over. The conversation's over. <laughs> this happens a lot in America. And uh, my poor wife, who's German, uh, you know, she... She moved to America to be with me, if you can believe it. I still can't believe it. Anyway, there she is. And we're channel surfing late at night. Every other show is, you know, Hitler, all Hitler, all the time. You know, Nazis, Hitler, Nazis. She's like, we got over Hitler decades ago. And, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it, it, but again, don't do that. You know, leave emotions out of it. You know, try to see if you can articulate the other person's uh, position. This is really actually hard to do. It's hard to do for two reasons. One, they may not actually believe that when you say it clearly. Where they can hear it, it's like, oh, when you put it that way, it does sound kind of ridiculous. Uh, but let me put it another way. So, you, know, so you, you sort of negotiate what it is exactly you're debating. You know, so you can find out what, what are, where they're coming from. What is it that bothers them so much about this little factoid you're talking about? And usually if you bore in a little bit, you can figure out, okay, it's touching a nerve because of this thing over here, this deeper uh, foundational belief that they have. So you have to kind of skirt around that. You know, with, with climate deniers, I'll, I'll, if I figure out that they're big pro-free market people, you know, I'll say, okay, so, you know, this is a great opportunity to make a lot of money in green technology. I mean, corporations are going to make a killing. Elon, I call it the Elon Musk model. You know, it's just the solution to climate change. Electric cars, batteries on every house, you know, solar panels that look like regular tiles, and so on and so on. You know, that's, it, it's sort of a positive way, like... Uh, don't, don't worry about whether it's happening or not. It's, it's happening, but don't worry about it because we're gonna, all going to make a lot of money. It's going to be great. Uh, you know, so that kind of, and I used to believe like you used to, I used to be a climate skeptic. You were? Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, like that, long time ago. And I, you know, I, oh, so that kind of puts you on, on a level with them. Like, they, okay, I, I, can, I can identify with this guy because he used to believe what I believe. I, and I do this with Christians because I used to be a Christian when I was in high school and college. I went to Pepperdine University, uh, which is a Church of Christ school. Uh, it didn't hurt that it was in Malibu on the beach, admittedly. Uh, but there, you know, there it was. So now I, I did that for seven years. And, and so now I can say, I completely get where you're coming from. I used to believe, you know, I totally, uh, it's uh, completely coherent and logically internally uh, consistent uh, until you, you know, step out and, and, and read these other books and think, of, well, what happened? You know, they say, what happened? Like, this couldn't happen to me, could it? <laughs> and, you know, so you take a little more respectful position, bond with them a little bit, don't attack. You know, those are the sorts of things I think we could do, um, short of just, you know, marshalling the best arguments you can, which does work for some people. 
So when I, you know, I do debates, um, you know, we're, I, I'm not going to convert my debate opponent on whatever the subject is, and I'm not going to convert the hardcore believers in whatever it is we're debating. It's the, it's the undecided voters, as politicians put it, you know, the kind of vast middle that haven't made up their mind, and, and, you, and, you, and you sort of hope you can get to them and maybe plant a seed of doubt in the believers by just, you know, being reasonable, uh, being respectful. On well, the other reason, restating uh, somebody's position, it is hard for us to listen to somebody we don't agree with and actually hear them and then say it. So when you say it back, you usually find out either they don't really believe that quite the way they think they do, and, and you, you're not really hearing them quite the way they're saying it. So you just kind of go back and forth. To get, does it work? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I think you, I think you can reason people out of, uh, of their beliefs of anything. I, I absolutely think that. And I have letters. <laughs> I mean, we all have letters. We have emails. We have, you know, we, okay, so... Um, but we know from research on this, again, in, in cognitive psychology, dealing with cognitive dissonance and so on, you can change people's minds. You can. Through those kinds of techniques that I think uh, work for some people. The idea that uh, at some point we'll get to, to the point, you know, if you follow the curve of, like, say, northern European countries from the Second World War till today, it's pretty encouraging. I mean, it's like a, it's not quite Moore's Law of doubling every, you know, 12 months of the number of people that are no longer religious, but, uh, but it's encouraging. You know, and, and it turns you know it turns out America is really the outlier in terms of Western democracies. We are the most religious of the twenty uh, top most prosperous Western democracies. And it, so, in the moral arc, I talk about this study done by Gregory Paul showing he, he has something a measure he calls societal health, which he he uses about half about a dozen different metrics: you know, homicide rates, suicide rates, gun violence rates, crime rates. STD rates, teen pregnancy rates, abortion rates, uh, infant mortality rates, and so on, uh, and, and more. Um, and, and, so, and we are the most American, the most religious of all the 20, and, and the lowest, or the highest, <laughs> depending on which measure you're talking about, on those societal health measures. You know, we have the highest abortion rates, highest STD rates, highest homicide rates, highest suicide rates, highest gun rate. Uh, uh, gun, gun homicide rates, highest crime rates, and so on. So, now, to be fair, it's not that religion causes all those things, but if religion is such a great prophylactic against the negative, bad behaviors, how come it's not working? Of course, conservatives say, oh, it's all the liberals doing those things. <laughs> no, sorry, Fox News, it's not. <laughs> it's not just all the liberals doing those things. And, and in any case, you know, 90% of Americans believe in God, and half of them are liberals, so they, they, they can't, the liberals can't all be the atheists that just you know, are these immoral people doing no, it's not That's not it. So it's something else, okay? And clearly European countries, which by all of those measures and more, self-satisfaction, happiness levels, and so on, are, are off the scale higher than we are without religion. So whatever it's doing, it's not helping, and it may even be hurting in some areas. So why not give it up? <laughs> you know, that's one way to kind of approach it, uh, that I, you know, I, and I think, you know, maybe by 2300 or so, you know, when we're in the Star Trek 23rd century generation, finally, you know, we'll get there, uh, maybe. So another positive thing that I end that book with is the um, increase in prosperity. Uh, this is sometimes called Star Trek, Trek economics, Star Trek economics, or, you know, post-scarcity economics. It's the idea that by 2100 or so, well, Bill Gates is projecting by 2030 there'll be no one in poverty anymore anywhere in the world. Poverty defined by the UN is less than $1.25 a day for extreme poverty and less than $2.50 a day for uh, regular poverty and that there'll be nobody at that level by 2030, 2035 maybe at the outset. So that's encouraging, although making $3 a day doesn't make you prosperous, so <laughs> given it, it's a scale. Uh, but, but the economists I've uh, talked to, are, you know, they're projecting out by 2100 or so There'll be more money per generated, more wealth generated in the 21st century than all previous centuries combined, which is what happened in the 20th century and the 19th century. So this is one of those accelerating curves that one of the things religion does is it helps the poor. So if no one's poor, that's another reason that you don't need religion. You know, it's not the only thing it does. So this is one of the arguments why... America is so much more religious than European countries, northern European countries, because your governments take care of the poor better than our government takes care of the poor. And in, in, in essence, welfare and Social Security is more privatized in America, and it's mostly religions that do that. 
And so there's a role for them. Although you go to these mega churches like in Southern California that I've been to or Texas, you know, there's a lot of Rolls Royces and Lexuses and Mercedes parked in those parking lots. So these aren't poor people going there to you know, have, have be told that it's okay, it's going to be great in the next life, like Mother Teresa. You know, that's why Hitch was crit critical of Mother Teresa, reasonably so, that the poor don't need the promise of the next life. They need water. They need food. They need shelter. They need vitamins. They need basic stuff. Right? That, so, again, I think. Projecting forward, I think we can be optimistic about that, that the, we will no longer be this tiny minority. And I think that's happening already. And in terms of civil rights, you know, in terms of like the latest ones, gay rights I mentioned, animal rights is really the next big thing. I really think, you know, so atheist is in there somewhere. You know, this, the discrimination that atheists can't be moral, you know, that we're not good citizens or whatever, even that's starting to change now. I think that's, that's seeing a shift. And we'll, we'll kind of ride the wave of the gay rights, LGBT community, uh, and into the animal rights thing, and I, I think in a few more decades, uh, it won't even be discussed anymore. Much like uh, in 1959, in America, only 4% of Americans thought it was okay for blacks and whites to marry. And it's like, really? And it, it, and it was illegal until 1967 when the United States Supreme Court voted to uh, make it uh, non-discriminate. You can't discriminate based on that. So, and same-sex marriage was legal in 19, 19, 1967. And now no one even asks on these polls, you see the Gallup polls and Roper polls, that no one even asks that question because it would be like, what? What are, what are you talking about? And, and the same thing will be true with same-sex marriage and, and I think all these other things will fall. It'll just become common acceptance. And, and that's how moral progress happens. It, it, it first requires you change people's, well, first of all, you have to change the law. Because ultimately, you have to have a state with the rule of law or, or, or people are not, we're not that good. <laughs> we're not good. We have inner, better angels, but we have inner demons. So you need a state. But, but that's not enough. Obviously, it'd be better if we didn't have to enforce the law constantly. That if you change the control mechanism in people's brains so they control their own behavior, then you don't need the state to enforce those particular things. And that's what I think we've been doing for centuries is learning self-control, learning to expand our own um, sphere of who we consider an honorary group member, an honorary uh, friend, even if you don't know them. And, you know, that's, we know how that works now with the nonprofits. You know, when they want to raise money, it's an interesting, interesting study show that the, the more people you show in your brochure or the picture or the commercial, the fewer dollars you raise. So, but, but if you have little Indugu sitting there in a mud, you know, starving to death, and here he is, little Ndugu, and he loves soccer, and here's his brother and sister, and he t a dollar a day will give him, the money will start pouring in, right? So you identify, I call it the Ndugu effect from uh, that Jack Nicholson film about Schmidt, where, you know, he's a middle-aged, re retired insurance salesman or whatever he was, and he, late night commercials, he sees that one of these things are little Ndugu, and he, and he donates. He ad you know, adopt a child, and uh, you know, say it's like thirty-five bucks a month. I've done it. It's not that not big. Yeah, the money goes hopefully <laughs> to the right charity. Now, this effective altruism, I should say, it, that is a concern. Where does the money really go? You know, and so Peter Singer's website, um, thelifewecansave.com, I think, right? The life you can save. Yeah, you. you. <laughs> Uh, he, you know, they've screened these charities, and here's their top two dozen charities or whatever. In terms of the, the, the rate, the, the, um, the metric is to what extent do you, does your dollar go directly to um, the people in need versus um, overhead and salaries and things like that. So um, I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, we're seeing more and more of that's going to continue to push the, the moral. Like just, just by identifying with people, uh, we know from cognitive studies that, um, that people are, who score higher on openness to experience in the big five personality dimension, op ocean, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. <laughs> Don't worry about that last one. <laughs> uh, but, you know, openness to experience or th things, things like, I like to travel. So if you, you can, there's been studies done with people that have a lot of travel books in their, how, in their library. Uh, their score, they score higher on openness to experience. And they're also more liberal. They're more tolerant of people that are different from them. And they tend to be politically more liberal. And so on. But, but all of us are making that shift. Even conservatives today are more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s. And they don't even know it. They've just, they still think they're conservative. 
that, that, but you know, the, you know, most conservatives in America would they would never object to interracial marriage, and and pretty much most of them now have shut up about gay marriage. You know, they're all just a couple of years ago, up in arms on talk shows every night. And now, the, the subject has been dropped, and, and they're just like, well, whatever, dude, I don't care. <laughs> oh, really? What what happened to those arguments you had five years ago? Well, okay, but you, you don't have to say that. Just let them come along <laughs> for the ride, and, and you know, we'll continue to get there that way. Uh, Anyway, so that's, uh, that, and I'll just say a few more words about my next book, and then we'll just have dialogue. Um, so, the, you know, the heavens on earth, so the title is Heavens on Earth, Heavens with a Plural, The Scientific Search for the Afterlife, Immortality, and Utopia. So I go through the, you know, uh, the, the religious arguments for heaven and hell, um, and, then, uh, and then the scientific attempts, and why I don't think they'll work. Unfortunately, I can't end on an optimistic thing like, you know, Ray Kurzweil and the Google boys are going to upload our brains into a computer and we get to live forever. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon or our lifetime at all. And I'm not even sure it would work because here I, I have a discussion on the problem of identity and who you are. Uh, now, I don't, I'm not sure I know the answer to this because I'm, I'm not sure anybody knows the answer to it. But who are you? Are you just your set of memories, the mem self, uh, such that if we copied your connectome, as it's called, the equivalent of your genome, every single synaptic connection in your brain, copied it and then reproduced it, either in another brain or some other platform, a computer like Johnny Depp and Transcendence, turn the computer on and the little computer, you know, camera comes on, it's you looking through the, you know, like the NSA, looking through your computer or whatever. Uh, you know, is that, is that the case? And I, I don't think so because... The copy of your connectome would be just that. It's just a copy. And these arguments are always premised on you're dead, and now, now you're in your computer. But what if you're not dead? What if we somehow copied it, put it in there, but you're still sit, sit, sitting there? Well, it's just, another, it's just a copy of you, like your twin. And the moment the other copy starts living its own life and having experiences and, say, growing new neural connections with new experiences, it's, it's not you anymore. It's now a different person, like your twin would be. And so, like, when you go to sleep at night, you wake up in the morning, there's a continuity of self. You're a little groggy. Uh, and, you know, the dreams are like, was that real? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and so that's good, you know, and the, but then it comes back. The self comes back. And, and if you go under general anesthesia, and you come back a few hours later, you're groggy, but, but then you're back. And so if you close your eyes and, I mean, to do any of these things, like be chronically frozen, you have to be dead in terms of what the state will allow you to do. So if, just think about that for a second, in cryonics. You are being frozen on the worst day of your life. <laughs> you, are, you are dead. It doesn't get any worse than that. And, and, you know, and that's what gets preserved. Okay, so their answer to that is we're going to fix all that with these nanobots that we inject. And they go in there and repair all the cells and get rid of the cancer cells. And, okay, you know, maybe. You know, we're just really talking utopia here, which is why I talk about utopias in the book. It's all utopia. Right? But, but even if you could master the technology, again, I don't see, other than, say, if you were chronically frozen and you just woke up, like after a long sleep, maybe. You know, maybe that would still be you. But I don't see how they copy in the connectome or so on, or you could just try to live longer, which is what these radical life extensionists do, uh, you know, calorie restrictions, if you want to call that living, uh, <laughs> allegedly they, they live longer, but that's, even those studies are not holding up too well, uh, you know, Aubrey de Grey is the scientist who wants to re-engineer our cells, he's got these seven steps you have to go through to clean out your cells, to get rid of all the junk in them and so on, anyway, they, they've not accomplished in, any one of the seven. And you have people like Ray Kurzweil, the singularity guy who you know, takes 250 vitamin, vitamins a day. You know, I've been with him. He's just sitting there all day. <laughs> you know, his pee is probably just bright green and yellow, <laughs> glow in the dark. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's no really evidence that that's doing much of anything. I mean, maybe if you can live slightly healthier and the quality of your life it lasts into the 90s or 100s. I mean, this is one of the, it's Shermer, don't you want to live to be 500, 1,000, 10,000 years? I'm like, just, just get me to 90 without Alzheimer's and I'll be really good. 100 without cancer, you know, and then maybe 110 and I still know where I am and even who I am. That, that would be, I'll be happy with that. You know? And then when I get there, if you can get me to 120, 130, just take it one year at a time. Okay, so, 
Uh, but, you know, so again, it's that utopian idea. No, forget that, forget that. We're going to live 10,000 years. It's like, that's a long time, you know what I mean? What's that going to do for careers and marriage? Uh, you know, <laughs> oh boy, uh, divorce lawyers. Um, you know, let's just worry about, just worry about that later, right? So, you know, that. you know, so I'm not particularly optimistic about any of that. It's so interesting because the people you meet are like religious, almost cult leaders. You know, I've been to the Singularity Institute conferences and people are just you know at the feet of ray kurzweil like he's you know moses he's coming down i got i got we're gonna live forever if you can make it to 2035 maybe 2040 and people are doing the calculus uh you know i can make it i can make it i don't think so i don't i don't just don't think that's going to happen um and uh you know so what are we left with you know so the well the attempts to create heavens on earth it works pretty well as long as you have a big messy democracy like we're, experiments that we have Every attempt, you know, I've read on, uh, attempted to engineer societies, it just doesn't work because we're too diverse, there's no one plan, there's no one correct way to be, most of them have an incorrect theory of human nature, which is mostly a blank slate theory of human nature that's uh, completely manipulable, which is not true. And uh, so then, you know, I just sort of finish up at the book talking, well, what have we got? Well, we have this. You know, we have ourselves. We have our relationships. We have love. We have respect, we have rights, we have all the things we've created. Um, and, you know, that's enough. That should be enough. And, uh, you know, the idea that it's not enough, then you're living the wrong life, you know, because what, what if there's no, what if it, it isn't there? And I really think religious people have just an inkling of doubt about that afterlife thing. I do. You know, they grieve just as much as anybody when they lose someone they love. And, and they say, well, I'm going to join, you know, I get to join them in the next life or whatever. Yeah, but you don't seem super anxious to get there. Like, I'm, you know, he's, I'm going to off myself now so I can hurry up. I mean, people, that's not why people commit suicide. They commit suicide for depression and, and other reasons, but not, you know, ooh, I can't, except maybe the suicide terrorists. But even there, although motivated by religion and the promise of an afterlife, they really have more, you know, engaged moral modules about cranked up to 11 regarding who the Satan America and Israel, and so you know they're motivated by current political uh, things under underneath of which is their religion. So, but that's different. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I think I think people always have that doubt. So we have to you know give them something. And what you know, so this is what we do. We non-believers, you know, we we sort of stand up and say as a model, you know, I'm a happy person. I'm a fulfilled person. And you know, I end the book talking about this uh, recent research on. You know, there's a whole flood of papers on happiness. And uh, one of the things missing from that is that that may be the wrong goal. Um, Roy Baumeister has this social psychologist, Roy Baumeister, one of the most interesting uh, thinkers of our time, I think. Um, and he has this paper about the difference between happiness and meaningfulness. And that much of what we do doesn't make you happier, it, it, like plugging into a dopamine injector device or <laughs> morphine or whatever. That's not what we do. I mean, most of the time we're doing stuff that's not fun, you know, and we grind through our workouts or we go to work or whatever. We go through these different trials and tribulations just because it feels good to be challenged and pushed and, and to have some, you know, sort of meaningful purpose that makes you feel better in the long run, even if it doesn't make you happy now. So much of the happiness research, you know, they, they give people these little, um, uh, what you call it, buzzers. Uh, the, the, you know, people used to use these things before cell phones. I'm sorry, I'm spacing out the little... Um, what it? Yeah, 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 pagers, yeah. I never had a pager. Uh, but, you know, that was a big... Thing. Anyway, so they would give them these little pagers and, you know, they buzz them and you bring in, how happy are you right now? You know, oh, I'm a nine. You know, and it's like, I think that's the wrong... This is what Roy's point is, and I think he's right. That's, that's the wrong question. Are you doing something that, you know, in five years or 10 years will make you feel better about yourself because you, you did something meaningful. And this is why a lot of the research shows that, you know, like effective altruism, joining a group like this, uh, you know, helping people. It, it, it probably isn't fun to go, you know, help the poor man, the soup kitchens, whatever, but it's meaningful. It makes you feel better about doing something that makes a difference in other people's lives. And, and so I think our emphasis should be on leading a fulfilled, purposeful, meaningful life it's okay to be happy along the way if you can do that, but that isn't the deeper thing I think that we're after. And uh, so I think the, you know, the, you know, what we're really after is those deeper emotions. And then actually end the book where I started, which is uh, an interesting study on, you know, what would you say 
if you knew you were about to die? It was like the last thing you would come up with. Because that's kind of a, a little bit of a test of, well, what's the most important thing to you? Now, there's not a lot of data on this, <laughs> but actually there's more data than you might think. Can you think of a good data set that you can only get in America now? People that know when they're going to die. Right down to the minute. The execution chambers, right. So I found this interesting database, uh, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, on their webpage. You can look it up, it's free, they're all posted on there. Um, they, uh, they've executed 520, I think it's 575 people since 1982. And 425 of them left a final statement. And it's sort of gruesome to, to read about this, but they're there lined in the execution chamber like Jesus on the cross. You know, and the needles are in the arms. And they give you a, one drug that makes you fall asleep, the next drug stops your, stops your heart, and so forth. And, uh, and then the microphone comes right down, you know, like, any final statements? And they record them, and then they're transcribed. It's on the webpage. You can read what all these guys said. By the way, it's guys. It's 575. There's seven women. Since 1982 have been executed in the state of Texas. The rest are men. So <clears throat> it's, not a, it's not a random sample for sure. Uh, but so I did a content analysis. First, I, I read through all 425 of them and just coded them based on what, what I thought they were trying to say in, in a bunch of different categories. And several of them had several things to say. And some of them were kind of amusing, like, you know, I'll never forgive that bastard that put me away, you know, some specific things, like, and some of them were kind of funny, like, I, di I didn't do the thing I'm being executed for, but I did kill this other guy. <laughs> like, oh, okay. And, uh, and a lot of them were, you know, it was an accident. I was trying to kill this other person, and I accidentally killed this other, you know, okay. And, and most of these people, they're, they're pretty bad, pretty bad people, really, when you read their records, because what they did is all on there. And it's, oh, boy. Um, and, uh, and anyway, but the number one category by far, 68% was love. That This is the, what they talked about more than anything else. I love my mom. Not one of them said they love their dad. Uh, and I think, most of, I think most of them didn't, don't have dads. Because uh, that turns out to be a, 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 a predictor of crime, is being raised without a, a father, at least in America. You know, with all the guns and alcohol and all the dangerous combinations we have there. So... Uh, but mostly, you know, I love my mom, I love my mo wife, girlfriend, sister, my fellow cellmates. I mean, most of the, the average length is, uh, is, I think, 12 years before between conviction and execution. And some of them are on there for many decades with the appeals process. Uh, so, so it was love was the number one forgiveness. Uh, you know, they're asking, not, 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 you know, forgive me, Jesus, but the people that are in the room because the families of the victim can go and watch the execution. So they're sitting right there, usually on the other side of a, of a mirror, a window, mirror, mirrored window. And so they, they, they know they're there and they apologize to them. So that was the second category. And so, but, but it was interesting that you know, the most important thing when you're about to die is I, I love these people. And I thought, okay, that's, that's pretty telling. You know, maybe that's the most important thing in the human condition is love, just love for other people. You know, so that's my conclusion to that book, and I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>